to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Spokane, where our mission is to join together to create a nourishing liberal religious home and to champion justice, diversity, and environmental stewardship in our wider, wider world, or in short, to create community, find meaning, and work for justice. Welcome to one and all. It's great to have you here. I want to begin as usual by Embracing all that you bring with you this morning, all of your unique beliefs, your background, your lifestyle, your experiences, all that make you who you are is welcome here today. And this includes those who hear us say this each Sunday as always, as well as those who might be hearing it for the first time today. You're equally as welcome and appreciated. And of course, it's true for those who are streaming with us as well. We're glad to have you with us today. So welcome to one and all. Got a few things to go over uh, this morning before we <clears throat> break into uh, a period of greeting one another. And I think we're going to start with a couple of special announcements from uh, Mary Ann Winifred and Doug Hugan. Hello, this is the month of the annual dinner. And I had hosts that were supposed to be calling or emailing everybody, but not everybody has been contacted. Some people are new, and we don't even have your information. Some people have dropped their landlines and never told the church that. So if you have not received an email or a call, I'll be back in the back with a sign-up sheet, and you can sign up there, and we'll get you assigned to a table. Thank you. It is August 28th, that, that, a, that a month, that's now, April, April 28th at 5.30. Thank you. And we've been working for weeks on uh, speaking out for justice, and this is the week where uh, we'll, next Saturday will be the Latin music concert at South Center, uh, Community Center, uh, Latin music dance, two great uh, uh, bands, Malanga and uh, Arriba, Jalisco, Mariachi. Uh, it's going to be fun, two different bands. Uh, we're going to sell uh, some art auction, about 20 nice uh, hangings from uh, many, mostly from uh, artists in our community. So 
Uh, $20 for a single, $35 for a couple. Hey, save buck, five bucks by two of you coming. And uh, hope to see you there. Thank you. 7.30. 7 Tickets in the back. Thanks, Doug. That's, that'll be 7.30 next week. Tickets for sale in the back uh, after the service. And this, of course, is going to raise funds to uh, help those who are most impacted by uh, the threat of deportation these days. So thanks, Doug, for, for helping to lead that. Um, speaking of fundraising, we are still in the midst of our annual generosity campaign, during which we ask you to submit pledges of support for the year so that we can budget accordingly. That sounds boring, but it's very important. And I really appreciate all your generosity and support. You can also uh, turn in a pledge card in the back uh, after the service today if you haven't done so, so yet. And I would like us to take a couple of moments for our generosity moment by asking George and Lila Gervin. Uh, are you still here? There they are. You changed seats on me. So come forward and uh, share a little bit about what the church means to you and, and why you are such uh, generous supporters. Good morning. So Cindy Phillips asked us to recount our history with this church. And this is um, our short version of, it's, it, it's got much more history, but this is our little version today. Our, um, our interest in support started during um, another turbulent time. Uh, maybe all times are turbulent, but it seems so uh, at that time. And as it is today, uh, the ideals and work um, in the community were so obviously compelling that 34 years ago we signed the Book of Membership. The focus this week is on the fourth principle and it is defining in our lives as we believe strongly in the search for each person for his or her own truth and mystery and what life means because of that, that search. You who share this journey together with us are friends and an inspiration. We are learning from each other. <clears throat> we feel fortunate to be able to financially support this church, increasing our support as we've gotten older and older. <laughs> and older. <clears throat> and older. So, uh, we are grateful for the work and life affirmations and the light in the times of darkness. We regard our love for and from this community to be an essential part of our lives. So we want you all to pledge and keep coming. Thank you. George and Lila, thank you both so much for your glowing spirits and for your generous support. Let's do take just a few moments to greet one another. I might have to cut it a little short this morning because we've got a, a, a big service, but uh, do take a few moments to greet one another. And as always, I hope you'll make some new friends today.
Another Unitarian got their wings. <laughs> well, as always, there'll be more opportunity to, to visit after the service, so I do hope you'll stay for that. But right now we are going to move forward by lighting our chalice, the symbol of our faith, the symbol of our unity and our solidarity of our openness and our inclusion of our community and our individual uniqueness. May this small flame be our offering of warmth to those who are cold and alone and a light to those in darkness. May it be a flame that ignites justice in our world and a beacon of hope to those in need. And may it reflect at least a spark of truth wherever truth has been lost and cast a healthy shadow of doubt wherever it's been found. The opening words were written by the wonderful author and poet Khalil Gibran. The appearance of things changes according to the emotions, and thus we see magic and beauty in them, while the magic and beauty are really in ourselves. And this commentary comes from my own The Old Little Nature Chapel. Though we must acknowledge the undeniable facts pertaining to our universe and the life we lead here, each one of us absorbs the world through the lens of our own vision, which colors every event. Believe in the reality of the magic of life, and magic will appear, transcending the everyday cares of our existence, making each day a wonder to behold and experience. Breathing the mystery, the joy, the ever-present light of our magnificent universe. Namaste. We're going to start this morning by singing uh, something that's sometimes called the UU prayer in our hymnal. Pardon? Somebody said something. Um, so we're going to do Spirit of Life, which is number 123. Please rise as you're willing and able. Twice through.
All right, we are going to have our story for all ages, so anybody who would like to come forward to join us is great. It's good to see all of you. Good to see my friend Sophia. I was thinking about you when I was writing my sermon because I mentioned philosophy. You know what the word philosophy means? Phileo Sophia. It means the love of wisdom. You know, you're, you know, Sophia means wisdom, I'm sure. Yeah. So I was thinking about you every time I, I, I think of philosophy, I think of Sophia, Lady Wisdom. Good to have you guys. You know, I usually bring a puppet, but I didn't quite bring a puppet today because I wanted to instead talk about a puppet, a famous puppet. Who's the most famous puppet you can think of? Muppets? Eh, darn it. You're never going to guess this then. Yeah, go ahead. Cookie Monster? You're right. <laughs> well, I was thinking of one, it shows my age, uh, uh, someone you've probably never heard of, his name was Pinocchio. Oh, yeah. You heard of Pinocchio? Okay. <laughs> so, you know, uh, the story of Pinocchio, of course, is that uh, a, a, lone, a lonely uh, wood, woodcutter, uh, Papa Geppetto, carved Pinocchio, and, and the Blue Fairy uh, liked Geppetto in his kindness so much that she made the puppet come to life. And Pinocchio wanted to become a real, a real boy, and so after uh, having some, getting into some trouble and his nose growing many times too large for lying, he, he learned his lesson to be brave and truthful and selfless, and she waved her magic wand and made him a real boy, right? But I've been wondering, whatever happened to Pinocchio? It's been a long time. I'm assuming he grew up. So I, I'd done some, some checking, and here's what I found out, okay? <laughs> So, but Pinocchio did indeed grow up, as you can see, he, he now has a mustache, and he grew up pretty much in the same village where he was first carved out, and uh, things went well for a few years, but the problem is Pinocchio always told the truth. You know, he, he was afraid that his nose would grow big or he would get turned back into a puppet. So he, he always told the truth, and, and that made it hard to maintain relationships. <laughs> you know, if, if he ran into somebody on the street and they said, Pinocchio, it's been a long time since I've seen you. We need to get together. Pinocchio would say, yeah, I don't think so. I don't want to, <laughs> if it was true. If, if, he, if he went out on a date, and the date said, this was great, I think we should do it again, Pinocchio said, yeah, I don't think so, <laughs> if he thought it was true. If he was invited to someone's house for dinner, they say, how did you like your meal? He said, well, it wasn't that great, if he thought it was true. <clears throat> so eventually, Pinocchio didn't have any friends. <laughs> and he decided, rather than risk lying to have friends, he would go off and live in the forest in a, in a hut by himself, and... And that way he would never have to worry about potentially lying and becoming a puppet again. Until one day, well actually, no, let me back up, because Pinocchio was feeling kind of lonely and depressed because of this. And finally went to the doctor and said, Doc, I just don't feel like myself. And the doctor said, well, let me check you out. Finally, the doctor took some x-rays and said, why, Pinocchio, you're human in every way except for one thing. You still have a wooden heart. Well, that really troubled Pinocchio, and Pinocchio said, I better really keep to myself now because I don't want to risk turning back into a complete wooden puppet. Then one day, a deer came knocking at Pinocchio's door in a panic. He said, please, please, you've got to help me. You've got to hide me. There's a hunter after me. So Pinocchio, without thinking, said, okay, come inside, go into the bedroom and close the door. So the deer went inside to hide. And before long, there was another knock at the door from the hunter. And the hunter said, I'm looking for a deer. Have you seen it? Oh, no. Oh, no. Pinocchio didn't want to lie because his nose would, would grow too long and he might turn back into a puppet. So he, he, he really wanted to tell the truth. And the, the hunter said, wait a minute, I know you. You're Pinocchio. I know that you never lie. I can trust you. Have you seen the deer or not? Pinocchio thought about it for a while. Finally said, No. I haven't seen the deer. And the hunter said, I believe you. You're trustworthy. And off the hunter went. And when the deer reappeared, 
it suddenly transformed magically into the green fairy, <laughs> goddess of the forest. <laughs> and the green fairy said, Pinocchio, you've learned to be truthful, and you've learned to be selfless, and you've learned to be brave, but the one thing you've not learned yet until this day was to have compassion, and that having compassion is the most important thing in the world. And therefore, I'm changing your wooden heart into a real heart. So from this day forward, you will be fully human. So that's what happened. Now you know. <laughs> we'll sing our kids out. It is now our great privilege and honor to be able to welcome some new members to our congregation. For, so for all of those who are new members, uh, going to sign our membership book this morning, would you please come to the front of the church? Sanctuary, I should say. So, so just turn around and face the congregation, if you will. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, it, I, I just want to say, is I think I, I probably mentioned a little bit during the new member class, what a, what a privilege it always is to have individuals think enough of our congregation, of our community, who want to sign our membership book. Because in so doing, you are doing literally the most significant thing you can do, and that is sign something, lending your authority, your authorship, your co-creatorship to this place. So it, it, it says as much uh, about us. It does, it does us such a great honor for you to sign our membership book, and we really appreciate it. So I'm going to uh, pass the microphone down and ask each of you just to sort of say your name so folks can begin to put a, a name with a face and then we will uh, ask the congregation to do a responsive reading and, and, and welcome you officially as well. Aya Batterson. My name is Michaela Barrett. I'm Dr. Kelly Rasmussen. Michelle Rasmussen. Angel Visnicker. Ayla Teggy, Nate Doran, Diane Huffman, Naomi Rose Lovett, Donovan O'Donovan, a.k.a. Pinocchio, <laughs> Aaron Popelka, Dave Mowry, Ben Ducharme, Vero Rabizanahari. Great to have you all. I am going to turn this microphone off and ask the congregation to turn to number 442 in your hymnal. And this is a beautiful reading in, in our hymnal that uh, I think really expresses well how we feel as a congregation about you being here. So number 442, and I'm going to ask those of you who are new members to just, uh, to just listen and take these words in. They are heartfelt. We bid you welcome who come with weary spirit seeking rest. Who run with troubles that are too much with you, who come hurt and afraid. We bid you welcome who come with hope in your heart. Who come with anticipation in your step, who come proud and joyous. We bid you welcome who are seekers of a new faith. Who come to grow and explore, who come to learn. We bid you welcome who enter this hall as a homecoming. Whoever you are, whatever you are, wherever you are on your journey, we bid you welcome. Thank you so much. Yes.
And we are going to sing a congregational hymn in a moment, indicative of the relationship I think that we have as a church community. And I'm going to invite you to officially sign our membership book and then take your place among us. And I think we're going to hand you a rose, also symbolic of a song we sing uh, of, of our togetherness, even though there's some prickliness to it from time to time. So. <laughs> So the hymn is 311, Let It Be a Dance, and we're going to sing until everybody is signed. Let it be. 
Real quickly, Some, somebody famous said, uh, let them eat cake. And so after the service, there's going to be cake in honor of our new members. We now gratefully give and receive this morning's offering which sustains this community and its mission to the larger world. We are now going to kindle our candles of care for those who are most on our hearts and minds. And afterward, we're going to move right into this morning's special music just to uh, keep on track the best we can here. But I did not get any uh, specific requests for candles this morning, so we'll move into a moment of silence uh, and give you the opportunity to name aloud those you might be thinking of at this time. Those named aloud and those embraced in our silence and all those who are suffering in our world at this hour, we hold in our community with compassion.
thanks again so much. That's just a beautiful, beautiful song. Something perhaps not so graceful as that song, if you missed it. Uh, about three weeks ago, a California man launched a homemade steam rocket in the Mojave Desert in his continuing quest to launch himself into space. How many of you caught that? Yeah, quite a few. So Mike Hughes, interesting fellow to say the least, a 61-year-old limo driver, former stuntman, a Guinness World Record holder for a 2002 limousine jump, who also hopes to run for governor, claims he has a legal right to Charles Manson's guitar, and wants to go to space to prove that Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin were just actors filmed on, this, on a set that looked like a moon, and to prove that the Earth is really flat. I'm not sure, or, or I'm, I'm pretty sure most of us at least would agree that Mr. Hughes doesn't need to build a rocket to go to outer space. <laughs> But even if he does eventually go high enough to see the rim of the earth for himself, he will use what he sees to confirm what he already believes is true. Many of today's flat earthers, as they're, as they're called, succumb to this same confirmation bias to explain already existing images of the earth from space. Instead of claiming it's a rectangle with flat edges, they now say that our planet is shaped like a frisbee. This not only allows them to explain its circular shape while maintaining that it's flat like a coin, but also explains why its edges seem to curve, giving the illusion that it's a sphere even though they say it doesn't have an underside. I don't know how they explain the apparent rotation of different continents across its flat surface but I already know enough about it to know that I don't care to know any more about it. <laughs> the point that we should not miss, however, is that Mike Hughes is an intelligent person. Intelligent enough to construct a launch pad out of his mobile home, build a rocket, a steam-powered rocket, and launch himself more than 1,800 feet into the air. Although he's told the Associated Press that he believes there is no difference between science and science fiction, he also admits, I know about aerodynamics and fluid dynamics and how things move through the air, about certain size of rocket nozzles and thrust, and th but that's not science, that's just a formula. So whether he considers it science or not, and no matter how unfounded and ignorant some of his beliefs obviously are, Hughes is also obviously an intelligent person. Now this is kind of a whimsical example of a common phenomenon in our society, the confirmation bias, interpreting the facts in ways that unreasonably affirm our pre-existing beliefs, that often has far more serious consequences. Some engage in pseudoscience to counter the claims of actual science. Now, pseudoscience, to be clear, is not just a, a made-up insult. It is the use of scientific-sounding language to explain certain ideas that haven't actually undergone the scientific method. Regarding global warming, for example, many who wish to maintain the status quo of exploiting and destroying our environment initially claim that there is widespread scientific disagreement about whether it's even happening, when it became no longer possible to deny that it is happening without sounding utterly ignorant, and I know there are some who still prefer to sound utterly ignorant, they used this same argument to suggest that there is widespread disagreement among scientists about its causes. These false assertions pit science against science without ever actually addressing scientific facts. Others have more creatively 
take in certain facts, like acknowledging that the earth periodically undergoes abrupt climate changes to argue what we're experiencing is natural and by implication is caused, isn't caused by human activity and by further implication there's nothing that we can do about it and thus there's no need to change our ways. The problem is simply stating a scientifically accepted fact then using it to prove one's bias isn't the same as science. Those claiming that today's global warming is cyclic haven't engaged the scientific method to prove their hypothesis. The claim global warming is based upon human activity, on the other hand, has a great deal of convincing scientific evidence behind it. Still others, like Hughes' belief the moon landing never happened, just simply dismiss what they wish, what they don't wish to believe as a hoax, or in today's terms, is fake news. And this has been a disturbing trend in response to some of the most horrific mass shootings in our country. Rather than admitting that we need to make it illegal for citizens to own machine guns, some conclude that mass shootings like the one responsible for the deaths of 21 first graders at Sandy Hook Elementary School are a hoax perpetrated by the liberal news media. Almost immediately following the mass shooting at a concert in Las Vegas last year, leaving 50 dead and 500 wounded, the crisis actor meme was invented, discrediting actual victims and survivors as paid actors like Armstrong and Aldrin, perpetrating a hoax. Some of them were inundated with so many crude, heartless comments accusing them of fraud or worse, they were forced to delete their social media accounts. The same cruel and insane accusations were also immediately hurled at student survivors of the recent shooting spree at the high school in Parkland, Florida. Whether they call what they don't want to hear a hoax, crisis acting, or fake news, or else turn on faux news to hear what they do want to hear, having their biases falsely confirmed, many in our society, many intelligent people, treat the truth as something they get to make up as they go along. Often on a whim, with no duty to be objective or thorough in its pursuit, and no duty to have integrity and be honest, at least, with themselves. And all of this leads to one of the questions that I want us to explore today. Why do smart people believe ridiculous things? Firstly, I would say it's because the truth hurts. The truth is a lot harder to believe than our myths. The truth may set us free, but true freedom often comes with a difficult price. The feeling of being alone, excluded, even persecuted for expressing our own authentic beliefs. Many of us prefer almost anything to being isolated from the comforts and benefits of society, from the feeling of belonging, even if it means conformity and hiding who we really are, sometimes even from ourselves. Eric Fromm said that our deepest need is the need to overcome our separateness, to leave the prison of our aloneness. We naturally want to be accepted by others, he said, but the modern person wants to be accepted by everybody and therefore is afraid to deviate in thinking, feeling, and acting from the cultural pattern. Or as Bertrand Russell once more succinctly said, people's opinions are mainly designed to make them feel comfortable. Truth, for the most part, is a secondary consideration. When this happens, we develop an authoritarian conscience meaning that we are willing to let external authorities do our thinking for us. No matter how absurd, 
that thinking might sound. We internalize the mind of the authoritarian as our own, mistaking its thoughts as our own. Very often this interaction of internalization and projection, Fromm says, results in the ideal character of the authority, a conviction which is immune to all contradictory empirical evidence. In other words, the facts not only don't matter to us, we become immune to them and are thus free to believe whatever the hell we want. This explains why a person who says things as absurd as Donald Trump can appeal to so many in our country. Claiming things like President Obama was born in Kenya, that Mexico will pay for his border wall, that he prefers war heroes who don't get captured, that he'd rush in unarmed to face a school shooter, and that he could stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody and still get elected. The more absurd he sounds, the more powerful he seems. Credo quia absurdumist, Fromm calls it. I believe because it is absurd. For those trapped in the authoritarian mindset, those who have given their ability to think for themselves to outside authorities who tell them what to think in exchange for feeling, the feeling of belonging and safety, rational ideas become unimpressive. If, however, one dares make a statement which is rationally absurd, Fromm says, the authority shows by this very fact that one has transcended the faculty of common sense and thus has a magic power which puts one above the average person. In short, to some, the more absurd, the more extreme and irrational an authority sounds, the more godlike they become. In light of what's going on in our country today, I would say this explains a lot. Keep in mind, Fromm wrote this in 1947 in response to what had just happened in Nazi Germany. Another reason that smart people believe ridiculous things is because human society seeks to control the ideas of its populace and always has. This explains historical ideological events like the Crusades, the Inquisitions, Fascism, McCarthyism, and the Cold War. Just as biology seems to care more about the information in our genes surviving than for the individual host, organisms of such information, the powers that be care little for individuals or their ideas, yet are obsessed with making sure certain ideas remain dominant forever. Passed on from one generation to the next, which explains why so many people today still adhere to ancient religious beliefs. So we can't blame the authoritarians who may be acting instinctively on behalf of the parasitic ideologies that have hijacked the minds of their host, preventing them from thinking on their own. Our authoritarian systems, which benefit only a few dominant ideas designed to exclude a wide range of thinking and free thought, control the meme pool in a variety of ways. In the past, this has occurred by adopting official creeds and declaring those who express otherwise to be heretics. Holding illegal ideas was then considered a crime, punishable by torture and death. In more recent years, in the U.S., those holding ideas differing from those of the status quo, particularly those ideology, ideologies that rewarded their compliant hosts with power and wealth, were officially declared dangerous, a threat to national security, traitors, and unpa unpatriotic, threatening them with imprisonment and unemployment. More recently, those who've benefited most from parasitic authoritarian memes 
They've used the power and wealth their symbiotic relationship has afforded them to take over the nation's flow of information. So their preferred ideologies can dominate our national discourse. We saw that just this week, right? With Sinclair News Media, which has rapidly been acquiring and consolidating control of our country's local TV stations, has been sending out corporate scripts read verbatim by its news anchors everywhere, ironically about the dangers of fake news. Another term, as we have seen, for dismissing inconvenient truths as hoaxes. By the way, this, this was the initial intent of, of something that happened during the Reagan administration with the invention of the so-called liberal media to discredit information. Can't be trusted. Another problem is that the truth from our perspective is always relative and incomplete. It's hard to know exactly what the truth is. 2,500 years ago, some philosophers started taking advantage of this by accepting payment for using their rhetorical skills to argue anything that their employers wanted. They were called sophists, which means wise ones. And the sophists weren't all bad, but philosophers like Socrates and Plato criticized them because they weren't as devoted to discovering the truth as they were to getting rich inventing it. Sound familiar? Today we don't call this practice sophistry, we call it spin. Our mainstream, corporate-owned and controlled media doesn't merely report the news, but often invents it by choosing what will and won't enter the national discourse, and by spinning the facts to mean whatever helps maintain the status quo. The result is some things that should sound insane to all of us end up being accepted as perfectly plausible and normal. Global warming is a hoax. Barack Obama was born in Africa and is a Muslim. The kids from Parkland are being used by the Hollywood elites and the FBI to push their liberal agenda. Statements like these are as absurd as they are obscene, yet many accept them without question. 17th century philosopher Baruch Spinoza once said that factually, greediness, blind ambition, and so, far, so forth are forms of insanity although usually one does not think of them as illness. This is so because certain thoughts and behaviors once embraced by the mainstream become normalized and thus seem perfectly sane even though there is no reasonable basis for them. War, mass incarceration, that's crazy. Racism, gender inequality, income inequality, destroying the environment, Cops routinely killing unarmed black men, voter suppression, the worship of ancient gods, and so on, are forms of neurotic to psychotic thinking that have been normalized and thus seem perfectly sane. Those of us who don't accept these destructive ways as normal may feel animosity towards those who do. But we should keep in mind that all of us are driven by psychological and biological forces we aren't fully aware of. If, as biologist Richard Dawkins has argued, memes, ideas, are like genes vying for dominance so they can outlast their indi individual host and get passed on in the meme pool, generation after generation, there can be little wonder why our ideologies are such a powerful force in our lives and in our societies. As I've mentioned before, some neurologists now say that the sense of knowing, which feels like a rational state, is really an emotional state. The feeling of knowing that is accompanied by a flood of dopamine to our pleasure centers. In other words, knowing the belief that we are right feels great. So we are physically wired 
chemically programmed to argue in favor of our ideas, not only because it feels good to prove ourselves right, at least in our own minds, but also because it feels rotten to feel wrong. This line of explanation is a bit of evolutionary psychology, which seeks to explain human behavior in terms of our own biology. So hard as it is not to take an adversarial attitude towards those we disagree with, we should keep in mind this possibility that the same unconscious biochemical forces driving some to promote their ideologies at the expense of all others may be the same forces driving us to promote our own beliefs. As one who considers myself a smart person, by my own line of reasoning, I must admit the possibility that I too might believe some ridiculous things, even though they feel perfectly reasonable to me. What I've tried to do so far is expose the processes by which such thinking occurs with some extreme and therefore obvious examples of faulty biased beliefs. What I really want us to grasp, however, is the process itself, which may underlie our own seemingly less extreme thinking. I've seen many people who share my beliefs rush to defend their ideas at all cost, sometimes by shutting down genuine conversation to avoid the risk of other ideas rising to the forefront. I've seen how quickly some mundane, practical matters turn into moral arguments because of the feeling our ideas are not only right, but therefore righteous. And I know that I am not above committing the confirmation bias myself or selecting only the facts supporting my pre-existing beliefs or spinning them in favor of my ideas or inflating my mundane beliefs into moral imperatives. Yet after all this, I don't believe it has to be this way. I don't believe we as individuals, as a species, or as a society, are condemned to live out our lives in this way, as unwitting pawns in a game of ideological dominance. Although my evidence is personal and anecdotal, I believe it's possible for not knowing to feel as good as knowing does. It is possible to rewire our brains so that our dopamine reward comes from questioning our own beliefs as well as those embraced by the mainstream. This is what my background in philosophy has ultimately done for me by forcing me to admit that the truth, if it exists, is unknowable. And the best I can do is expose the faults in my own thinking and the thinking of others. This attitude has led to my appreciation of humanity's mystical traditions. Those traditions that prefer not knowing to knowing. To living, that is, in the mist, in the mystery. Mystery within mystery is the gateway to all understanding, the Tao Te Ching tells us. Similar to other religions like Hinduism that says, one can only say, not, not, neti, neti. It is ungraspable, for neti cannot be grasped. Or Christianity's St. John of the Cross, among others, who said, the soul travels to God by not knowing, rather than by knowing. Or Judaism that says, every definition of God is heresy. Definition is spiritual idolatry. Or the poet, John Keats, who said that we must develop negative capability, being in uncertainties, mysteries, doubts, without any irritable reaching after fact and reason. Or the science of Einstein, who said the most beautiful thing we can experience is the mysterious. It is the source of all true art and all science. One to whom this emotion is a stranger who can no longer pause to stand wrapped in awe is as good as dead. Or as the philosopher James Carse says, knowing that we don't know is not only a higher ignorance, it is the basis of all our hope. Mysticism, as statements like these indicate, has persisted throughout time 
in a variety of disciplines and traditions, proving it is possible for us to live fulfilling, meaningful, inspired lives without clinging to our ideas, without the need to know, without the irritable reaching after fact and reason. This isn't to say that we need not pursue the truth, or that we should not be committed to it, only that paradoxically, the more that we seek it out, the more we come to accept that it is ungraspable. Neti, neti, not this, not that. As philosopher Bertrand Russell put it, philosophy is to be studied not for the sake of any definite answers to its questions, since no definite answers can as a rule be known to be true, but rather for the sake of the questions themselves. Mysticism and philosophy, as I have said before, isn't about piling up the truth, but about chipping away at it, like a woodcarver or a stonecutter, ridding ourselves of what we think we know in order to find the truth in the empty spaces we'd otherwise not consider. I do not believe that all truth is subjective, as Kierkegaard said, but I do think it's always experienced subjectively, filtered through our human limitations and our personal biases. So what I'm suggesting here is another way of living, another way of being together, in which we all admit we don't know the truth and begin behaving and relating to each other as if this were so. Imagine a world in which our leaders, our priests and our politicians, instead of being authoritarian ideologues, admitted their uncertainties, didn't claim superiority over others, and were open to discovering new ideas and new ways. Imagine that world. The truth is a myth, at least the notion that we can possess it is. But as I said, myths are easier to deal with than reality, so many of us would prefer to go on pretending to know the truth. I'd personally prefer to live without it. Thank you. We're going to close with a hymn called The Star of Truth. It's number 297 in your hardback hymnal. Please stand as you're willing and able. Stand. Would you play it through all the way? <laughs>
words come from the Old Little Nature Chapel. Let us remember that beyond the appearances, beyond the illusions, lies a magical world of divine light. Its password is faith. We are one in this marvelous universe where we are all invited to belong and partake of its joy together. Namaste. Amen. Blessed be. Salam Alaikum and Shalom. Thank you.